Yes, in the back and then fuel you. You mentioned a little bit that uh, you renovated the astronomy club from six years ago now. A lot of you may not be from that era from six years ago. Could you give me maybe a little bit of the background of what you did to improve the astronomy club? So, Jake and I are actually, actually the two members that helped uh, start way back when, 2007. Um, and really it was our advisor really wanted uh, the club to have an aspect of astronomy outreach going into the department and um, he asked a person who was more involved with the University of Arizona SEDS chapter which really was more of the astronomy club of the university nationally if you know anything about uh, students for the exploration and development of space. Nationally, they're more of an aerospace engineering type of um, organization. Uh, but ours was, you had aerospace people and astronomy people, and it was kind of folded into one. Um, but our advisor asked us to, let's, let's establish a astronomy club back as a, as a group. So um, I think they talked to like a freshman class of astronomy majors and said, hey, let's try to have a meeting. A bunch of people showed up. We elected officers. And a bunch means five people showed up. Uh, five people showed up and <laughs> I, I think there were a little more than five. There were five. <laughs> there were five Lead active, it to history. <laughs> there, there were about five active people um, that were really excited, wanted to get things going. We threw up a website. We um, we started kind of rallying SEDS members toward being in a astronomy club. I mean, they're still the ones with the 18-inch Dobsonian telescope, but we actually have a binocular telescope project in the works. So, um, so we've actually kind of separated the two institutions into nationally what they're more uh, tailored toward. So, and, and kind of our, our first steps were just, let's hang out. Our first event was actually pumpkin carving. Uh, there was a member that worked at a local Safeway on October 31st. He took all the pumpkins that weren't bought and we had a, we had a pumpkin par carving party. And uh, that's actually been held every year since. So, uh, and it's grown. Buell, you had a question? Um, it was related to that question, which was, why do you think the club has gone up and down over the years? We heard it started 30 years ago, and what do we need to do to make sure it doesn't decline again? Anyone? <laughs> I, I can take that again. <laughs> Allison, Allison you go for it, Allison. <laughs> um, we, in my experience, and I, I think Kevin would agree, um, a lot of times it very much depends on the people and we put a lot of time and energy into creating a system that's uh, self-continuing. Um, so the system of, of formal and informal mentorship within the club isn't just for research projects. We also <clears throat> might have people we're grooming for officer positions in the future. Um, so, you know, it, it clubs die out because they get a little too small and people stop coming and, and so um, and then they get restarted. So we're, we're very much hoping to create a system that, that is um, in, just s sustainable and inherently built to resist that. Um, but. And it, it really does all fall down, to, uh, down onto initiative of the students. Um, you've got to have at least a few very, I don't know, impressive students mm -hmm. uh, that can take some time to devote to club and outreach events. I mean, some of us spent a little too much time doing club stuff, um, but we think it's necessary to keep keep everything going. Um, so, and, and we've, we've tried to make it as exciting as possible. Like, come look at this awesome model that's sitting in our, our front lobby. Uh, this is what we've done. Everybody's walked by that every day in Stewart, but <laughs> so just keep it exciting. Okay. So the telescopes you use for outreach, are these owned by the club or owned by the astronomy department or owned by individuals? And, and for any of those, where are they stored? Allie's coming in. Okay. 
<laughs> so they are owned by the University of Arizona, but we have access to them. But they are used for any maybe public outreach that Stewart Observatory has going on. So we can basically go in and check them out and bring them back. And um, yeah, there's uh, three, four main ones that we have, uh, three main ones that we have access to. Um, uh, so we're very fortunate in that sense. And uh, um, and yeah, we're, we're actually uh, making our own binocular uh, telescope as well. So that would be completely ours. Um, you know, we've been buying the parts and working on it as we can. And um, it's, almost, it's like in the almost final stages. So once we have that, that will be our first physical own telescope that we can uh, uh, tote around with us. And we also have members who have their own telescopes in the community. We also have uh, members who have telescopes um, that are in Tucson. And so they will sometimes bring their telescopes to our Sabino Canyon star parties or other star parties too. So there was a question in the back. Yes. Should there be any sort of a analog to sense for astronomy, undergrad astronomy on a national level? That's a should. Should there be? So I think I, I can take that one too, because uh, I was I was in SEDS, and SEDS was basically the astronomy club. I was more looking for something that was that was for uh, astronomy students, and SEDS is a wonderful organization. It's national and international. They have chapters at many schools. Um, astronomy clubs, there there's no like overall astronomy club organization. Um, I know there's there's kind of overall amateur astronomy organizations, and that's also one thing that the club is trying to work on, kind of bridging the gap between professional astronomers, which we're all training to become, and the amateur astronomers, which tend to do uh, a lot more outreach, but they're kind of uh, becoming more into the research with uh, all sorts of citizen science type projects. So. Um, we're, we're trying to bridge the gap between local uh, amateur astronomers and the professional astronomer community um, because we think that would be a, a wonderful resource for everybody to have. I mean, as long as we get the word out that astronomy is awesome, uh, I hope we can succeed. I'd like to ask you a question. I'm always impressed by how many U of A undergraduate students are at AAS meetings. It's impressive. What do you think makes your undergraduate group pull together and get to AAS meetings? Because this is no small feat. <laughs> And what lessons learned might you share with other undergraduates in other departments or other people in their departments that could help undergrads come to AAS meetings? Okay, I have something to say about it. So I joined astronomy club my second week as a freshman, and I was pretty bummed because you know you go to college and you're waiting and you have to take your requisites and you can't take the astronomy course yet, but. I met these guys and within about a month we were up at a telescope taking data, reducing it. I didn't even know what a terminal was and then all of a sudden I'm reducing data in Iraq before <laughs> a year and a half before I could even get into astronomy course, right? So, uh, and then uh, five months, you know, my, right after my first semester I was at a AAS in Austin seeing uh, presentations, seeing research, um, and then I was on a paper and a poster within a month after that. So it was just... Um, it gives you that fulfillment, you know, you, 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 you take these really hard courses, you get discouraged, uh, you get told you can be whatever you want your whole life, and then you go to college and then you're like, you got a bad grade and you feel terrible, but these, it's a, it's a huge support system. It made me realize I can do it, like I can succeed and I can do research and I can do that all without even hitting my upper division. So um, I would just say that it, uh, it just gives you that gigantic fulfillment and that uh, that knowing of acceptance and knowing that you can do it. You see other undergrads here, you come, and not only that, but now that I am in my upper divisions, like I've seen all of these research, I, I'm in my astronomy class, I've seen people already do this type of research, I've been to telescopes, you know, um, and, and it makes it that much easier for my coursework as well. So I just, just giving that retention factor and uh, that, that kind of feel good thing. It's, it's really easy to get discouraged with physics and math, obviously, and uh, I think that gives you that, that full satisfaction for uh, satisfaction that. Um, so as far as encouraging students to go to AAS, um, 
I, I was lucky enough to have an REU very early in my college career, and everyone, all of the professional astronomers at my REU were very encouraging and said, oh yeah, you definitely need to, you know, everyone should go to AAS, you should join the society as a junior member, you should go and present. Um, but that's not as common in your standard astronomy department. Um, but Kevin and Amy and, and the senior astronomy club officers never presented it as not possible. They never presented it as a, a, you know, a weird thing. It was just, hey, you're an astronomy club. Oh, you want to be a professional astronomer? You should consider going to AAS straight off the bat. It was never like, you should consider going to AAS, but it'll just be weird because they're all grown up astronomers. Like, <laughs> um, Astronomy Club is also lucky enough to have been doing this for a while, so we know the system. We know the system for requesting travel funding from our um, student government. We know Gina, who knows everyone, which is incredible. <laughs> um, but fortunately, we've, we've been around for a while, um, so we, we have all the documentation we need for requesting money. Um, we know approximately how much it's gonna cost We've done, you know, we're all staying at the same hotel, we're splitting rooms, um, it makes things much more affordable. It is important to make things affordable. There's not a lot of money for travel, there's even less for undergraduates, um, so we have to be really creative, but I would just say, look for money anywhere you can find it and cut costs anywhere you can, but by all means, get undergrads to AAS. I want to add just a little bit to that. Uh, really, with this astronomy club, our very informal model that motto that only I know is if there's a will there's a way um, money should never be the 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 stopper from getting you to come to a meeting um, that you are very excited passionate about uh, so I mean we're undergraduate students we find free food as much as possible we find ways to, to get to the conference uh, Gina is wonderful and gets us next day. Uh, we all volunteer, or many of us have volunteered, or uh, a lot of us, if we're presenting research for our research advisors, um, a couple of us are here uh, from research advisor uh, support. Uh, some meetings uh, we've driven to. Uh, I think uh, a bunch of us drove to Austin, Texas from Arizona. Everybody went to Long Beach. Um, here, most people flew. Uh, I drove because I'm in Toledo now. Um, but and maybe staying at not the conference hotel, um, if it were cheaper, we'd definitely love to. Um, but usually there are enough uh, hotels within walking distance. We make it as accessible to students as possible. And we do get a lot of support from um, certain research faculty and uh, the University of Arizona uh, student government is very supportive and um, they so far haven't denied us any money. So <laughs> we're very lucky. Oh, absolutely. Okay. This is your time. <laughs> okay. Kind of uh, adding to what Allison said, um, is basically, so at the university you have your classes and your academics and AAS seems to be more, a lot more research type stuff. So if you haven't gotten into research yet, you kind of don't see why you should go to the AAS. Um, so I think a big part of why so many people are coming here is because they've done the research. Um, they've done projects with us and they've seen their um, fellow students uh, have posters that they're taking to AAS and presenting um, and they they know what's going on basically and they want to come and be a part of it. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is kind of a question for Kevin. Now that you're at the University of Toledo, are you planning on staying plugged in to what's going on at the University of Arizona? Are you planning to try to expand, um, say, the remote connections to have the, to sort of extend the reach of what's going on at the University of Arizona? Definitely. Um, I, I have moved on, but as many of these guys can attest to, I haven't moved on yet. <laughs> um, I, I'm still more involved than I should be, um, even being over a thousand miles away. Um, but these guys are, are continuing, thriving on their own. I mean, first year grad studies are painful, so I haven't done anything for the club uh, 
just in Tucson, um, but people still come ask for advice. Usually, I mean, somehow, how some clubs fall is that they have all sorts of new people, and they have no idea how something is done. Um, like for us getting funding, uh, there are specific people at the university to contact for funding, and these guys know what it is, but maybe they'll have a question about, oh, what form do I need to fill out, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm more than willing to try to help them figure it out because I probably did it. So stay, staying around for a little bit to, to kind of buffer the transition from me not being there uh, is probably helpful to these guys. So I'm more than willing to give my opinion about anything because I went through the entire undergrad process uh, that these guys are uh, currently going through. Yes. Do you have, uh, have you considered and do you guys have already some sort of like documentation of that, you know, like a wiki page or something like that so that you can kind of help that transition and overlap throughout the years? We have um, recently, like this past year, started a logbook. Um, I, I was president for calendar year 2012. And I found at the end of my presidency, I just had these folders and folders of relevant files that I did pass on to Mandy, who's the current president. But um, we wanted some form of storage other than somebody's personal laptop. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have we have a notebook that has pertinent information. Um, we're working on. I'm working on filling it with you know contact information, even for star parties that we we did the year that I was president so that if we ever need to get in touch with somebody again, or or even so that a few years down the road, um, the astronomy club who may be full of people we've never met can look back and say, oh, we were doing this, and we did this many star parties once upon a time, and um, this many were schools, and that sort of thing. Um, it isn't online. We are slowly and surely and sort of in fits and starts hoping to get our own server or our own computer so we can store everything there, um, also including club pictures, and it would be a good thing to have our own server because all of our data right now are on steward servers, which is fine, except occasionally they crash and then we don't know that they've crashed and we can't access our data. And, um, so yeah, we are, we are working on that. It's, it's not as institutionalized as I would like, but we do have a space for the information to be stored for incoming um, students and officers uh, as well. So I'd also like to add uh, one more thing. Uh, as we all know that funding and money is also extremely important in when you're passing down the torch to all the other, the future generations of students that are gonna come through the club, we need to know how to communicate with students that we haven't even met, that we probably, you know, we might not. We need, we need to communicate with them how to manage money and how to, um, what, you know, what, what things cost. Things, I mean, obviously things are changing over time, but uh, we also have a logbook for uh, funding and, you know, when people take out uh, money, they document it on, in a file, uh, handwritten so that it doesn't disappear in, in internet land or um, <laughs> things like that, you know, technology, things go wrong. So having something tangible that you can actually literally hand to the next person is extremely important. But it has, what's more important is it has records of receipts, um, you know, important contact information, um, as well as uh, applying for money from ASUA. It gives you all of these steps um, along the way. We did say that we had those um, put together so that it's a little bit easier every year because we've done it before. Um, so having a freshman start doing it, they've done it for four years, and it just continues going on, and so they can see the logbook, they can look at it, they can pass it on, um, so, yeah, something tangible to help us with funding as well. Uh, that could be another reason why some clubs can kind of, you know, fizzle out. They run out of money, which is, you know, it's unfortunate, but we're trying our best to avoid that situation. Yes, uh, I'd just like to comment on a few parallels with what we've done at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, we do send members of the astronomy club to all the freshman orientation sessions and summer orientation so that uh, we found out they are better uh, 
to speak to the students about what their major is going to look like than the professional astronomer goes to speak about the major. And so they're all invited to the club sessions. The university also, in the last few years, has started really asking college and natural science students to join a freshman research initiative. And so students from their very beginning of their freshman year can start working with a research group. And it could be in their major or another major, but this makes a big difference in retention at the university as a whole, not just retention in the major. Well, I certainly hope you'll encourage your students to participate in their special session at the January meeting. There is a, yes. I just wanted to comment too about, um, someone mentioned earlier about you know, small departments. I'd love to have six or seven astronomy students in my department. But we have 10 physics majors in our whole program. So, but it means that as the advisor for the physics club, I have a lot more work to do. But on the other hand, it started up very slowly with two or three students. And once you start actually doing things, that's what attracts people. So the success builds on the success. And then you have somebody that's an education major that wants to be in the astronomy or physics club because we do things. And you know, I love listening to the education stuff because I run a humanitarian. And um, we have people that join just because they like doing the average stuff. They're education majors, biology majors, and their club doesn't do any outreach. So um, I just think it's great. All the stuff that you guys are doing is stuff that we've been slowly working up to. So it's really great. And I love the outreach stuff. You guys should try to do some podcasts. Uh, yeah. so all, all of these yeah. talks will be available on the Australian They do that. <laughs> We have a that. Yeah, um, just that that's, you know, that's exactly what we found. And the Astronomy Club success is, is amazing, um, but it's only been within the last three years or so. Um, the club, club was growing slowly for a while before that. Um, and it is more difficult at smaller institutions. Um, there is a consortium of schools in the Northeast of liberal arts colleges called, it's the Keck Northeast Astronomy Consortium. Um, and they're a group of liberal arts colleges with astronomy departments that they're really not big enough to do quite as much on their own, so they got together in a consortium, um, and I think have found that, that that's been very successful. Um, but you're absolutely right, um, people are attracted to groups that do things. Um, so we try to always make sure we're doing stuff, and we definitely find that activities are our biggest draw. Um, we also do go to the, um, it's not actually, it's not exclusively for freshmen, but there's a, an undergraduate astronomy majors meeting every fall um, that we are invited to, and, and Astronomy Club always gives a talk there, um, just a you know five minute overview of the club. Part of the problem with that is it's just difficult to get freshmen to that, um, which you know, it's difficult for the department to do and it's difficult for us to do. Um, freshmen are just sort of so overwhelmed with everything that's going on that they don't make it to things until sophomore year. Um, but we do very much, um, we, we make a very concerted effort to get in touch with the freshmen because we want them to start doing research right away. Yes? I have a rhetorical question, which is more habit forming, learning a cool thing or sharing a cool thing? <laughs> learning a cool thing or sharing a cool thing? Which is bad? Sharing. sharing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I actually think that those are one and the same. You actually learn by sharing as well, so they're both, they're both the cool. <laughs> Did anyone want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's one and the same, basically. Uh, I mean, again, it solidifies. I mean, I'm a, I'm a planetarium operator, too, so anyone who's listened to my star talk gets to learn about what I'm learning for that week, but it solidifies <laughs> it for my own brain. Also, it gives me, uh, I don't want to say, it, it, it can break it down into simple mechanic terms that I can explain to people and then when I'm sitting on a test I say, oh, I, I remember the simple things and um, I mean, as we've probably all seen as humans, the more simple explanation is the one that usually works the best anyway. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one and the same. Um, it solidifies it for your own brain too. Did any of you want to add any final remarks to our conversation? I'd just like to say thank you all for attending and listening to us. Um, it's very encouraging as undergraduates to be able to um, give a talk and, you know, first, I have to admit, it's kind of intimidating, 
Um, we've never done this before. It's our first professional talk, and uh, you guys' support, we feel it, and we appreciate your attendance, and uh, um, yeah, that's what I'd like to say. Well, I would just like to say a closing word. You all are amazing. What they have done in our department is amazing. The way that they nurture each other is amazing. They make sure that the younger students in our department know what the AAAS is, know that you have to apply, how to apply. When you look at a membership application, it looks intimidating. I don't know if the membership people at the AAAS have read it recently. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go ask people for signatures and stuff. Anyway, they're just an amazing group. And I really do encourage those of you who either have astronomy clubs at your own institutions or know of other institutions that have undergraduate astronomy clubs to please have that join in on the special session that these fine undergrads have proposed and are organizing for January. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Okay, I'm sure that they're around to mingle with. Have a great day. <laughs>